Let's continue the fossil discussion with energy sources. So remember, for any muscle to work, all living cells, just like muscle cells, have got to have ATP. That is the fuel that powers these cells, just like gasoline does your car. So what are the energy sources for this ATP? One of them is creatine phosphate. Now that's a short-term energy source. This could power a muscle for several seconds, maybe 10 or so. Be good for somebody like a sprinter who needs energy in a short amount of time. Other than that, not too useful. When you talk about producing energy, what you almost always hear about is aerobic and anaerobic respiration. Now most all ATP in the body, in the cells, <clears throat> is made through aerobic. Aerobic means with oxygen. This chemical reaction requires oxygen to occur. If you look at the aerobic, you can see that ATP is not the only thing being made. Now here's why you've got to have a constant supply of oxygen and glucose to your cells. That's for this aerobic respiration. This chemical reaction is going to produce a net of 38 ATP, and at the same time, this is where the carbon dioxide comes from, and a small amount of water in the body too. Now, the anaerobic respiration doesn't require oxygen. It is a shorter, quicker chemical reaction, but the problem is it only produces a net of 2 ATP, and it makes lactic acid at the same time. So look at the difference between aerobic and anaerobic, 38 versus 2 ATP. Big difference in those two. That's why if you stop, say, moving oxygen around the body and delivering it to cells, they die soon afterwards. If you don't deliver enough oxygen and glucose, they can't go through aerobic, they're gonna run out of ATP and those cells are gonna start to die. Anaerobic won't keep most cells alive for very long. Cells that are very active, like neurons, can only live two to four minutes at most under anaerobic respiration. Your heart can go maybe 20 minutes and so on down the line. And oxygen dead is where that oxygen is being used up quicker than what you can bring more to the cells. If that happens, the cells are going to have to swap from aerobic to anaerobic. They don't like the anaerobic, but at that point, if they run out of oxygen, they've got no other choice. Let's also look at slow and fast twitch fibers. What these are, are different types of myosin. Remember when you look inside the muscle cells, what really gives you muscle contraction are the two myofilaments, actin and myosin. So here's two different types of it. One's called a slow twitch fiber and one's called a fast twitch. Now look at a comparison between the two. The slow twitch fibers contract more slowly. They're also smaller in diameter and they have a very good blood supply, a lot more blood going to these fibers here than the fast ones. They also have more mitochondria, and that's going to make them fatigue resistant. So think about this. If these types of myofilaments are contracting slower, they're burning up their ATP slower, and at the same time with a very good blood supply and a lot of mitochondria, they can make more of it faster. That's why they're going to be fatigue resistant. They also have a large amount of myoglobin in them. This is very much like hemoglobin that you see inside of red blood cells, but this here is found inside muscles, good for storing up oxygen. They tell you that when you look in your body, your postural muscles, or a lot of those in your lower limbs, are more slow twitch oxidative fibers. And if you look at something like the dark meat of chicken, the reason it's dark is because that's muscle type where you find slow twitch fiber, which has a very good blood supply. And that's what's making the meat darker, all the blood in it. If you compare that to the fast twitch fibers, now these contract and respond very rapidly. So they're gonna be using up their ATP very quickly. And with less of a blood supply and fewer mitochondria, they won't be able to make it as fast as the slow twitch. So these will be using up the ATP very quickly, can't make it as fast, and that's why they're going to fatigue a whole lot quicker. If you look at like the lower limbs in a sprinter, they're going to sprint. They need a very rapid release of energy. They need the fast twitch fibers. If you look at those lower limb muscles in somebody that runs a long distance, like 5, 10, 20 miles, whatever, they need the slow twitch. Now, if you look at the white meat in chicken, this is meat where you find the fast twitch fibers. Here, you find the fast twitch fibers with less of a blood supply, with less of a blood supply. That's why the meat is whider and a little bit drier. It's juicier with more blood in it, like you see in the dark meat. So the distribution of these fibers varies muscle to muscle, but through training, you can get more of one or the other, whatever you need. Again, look at somebody like a runner. If they're going to be a sprinter and they train for sprinting day after day, 
their body will make more of the fast twitch fibers. That's what they need because those work a whole lot quicker. They train for very long distances. The body will start to make more of the slow twitch fibers. That's what they'd need at that time. So when you talk, talk about effects of changing during exercise, there's a lot of things you can look at and the size is one of them. Hypertrophy means an increase in muscle size. If you think about it, if you train muscles over and over, everybody knows the muscle's going to grow larger. So you'll see more of the myofibrils, you'll see an increase in nuclei, an increase in strength, enzymes, better circulation, more blood vessels will start to grow and penetrate that area, all at the same time making that muscle work better. But let's say you stop using that muscle for whatever reason, it's going to atrophy, it's going to decrease in size. And you don't really see any of the cells being lost, but you do see a change in the cell size. Again, the number of muscle cells you're born with is all you're ever going to have. And that use it or, or use it or lose it <clears throat> definitely applies to skeletal muscle. Looking at heat production, remember the majority of the heat in your body comes from skeletal muscle. And that's because it makes up somewhere around 40% of your body weight on average. So that's a lot of living cells and burn up a lot of ATP. That's a whole lot of heat energy being released when that ATP is broken down. So, of course, when you exercise, metabolic rate goes up, you use a whole lot more of the ATP, and some of that breaking down of ATP escapes as heat energy. Post-exercise, your metabolic rate does, stays up for just a little while due to oxygen debt, but eventually that goes away, and everything will start to slow back down. And when you've got excess heat, remember the blood vessels close to the surface of the body will dilate. Remember, blood moves heat around your body, so if you move more blood close to the surface, along with sweating as that water evaporates, you'll lose that heat. And of course, if you get cold, the blood vessels in the skin are going to constrict, just the opposite of what we saw with vasodilation. Then if you look at shivering, that's rapid muscle contraction. That's going to break down a lot of ATP. That's going to generate heat, and that's what you need when you're cold. Now let's look just a little at smooth and cardiac muscle. Going back, giving a review of the smooth muscle. Remember, it does not have the stripes, the striations on a histology slide like you see with skeletal. The fibers are smaller than what you see with skeletal. Some of those skeletal muscle cells are very long, may run the entire length of a muscle. Remember that smooth muscle is spindle shaped. In other words, it's football shaped. It's tapered on the ends and thick in the center. Of course, you didn't have that with the skeletal. It was shaped more like a straw. They have a single nucleus, which is centrally located. Again, that's different from what you saw with the skeletal. And smooth tends to have more of the actin than the myosin myofilaments. You'll also see these structures called calveoli, which are indentations in the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane. They act a lot like the T-tubules on the skeletal muscle do. You'll also see dense bodies. <clears throat> now, these are sort of replacing the Z-disc that you saw in skeletal muscle. Calcium is still required to initiate the contractions, but here calcium binds to a different protein. It's a protein called calmodulin. We definitely did not see that with our skeletal muscle. And this will regulate myosin kinase, which is an enzyme which causes cross-bridge formation to occur. If you want relaxation of smooth muscle, you need an enzyme myosin phosphatase. Again, that's different from what we saw with the skeletal before. There's also a few different types of smooth muscle in the body. There's this visceral or multi-unit. Now the visceral is also called unitary, unitary, uni for one. That tells you this type of muscle, this smooth muscle tends to work together in a very good coordinated fashion. Reason being, these cells have numerous gap junctions in between them. Those are basically ion channels connecting cells. The better you pass those ions, the better communication you have, and the better the cells are going to work together. So those work very well, autorhythmic, often working on their own for different reasons. Then there's the multi-unit smooth muscle. This right here doesn't have as many of the gap junctions. So these smooth muscle cells are going to work a lot more independently of each other. And you'll find these in the walls of blood vessels, the erector pili muscle that stands hairs up on your skin, the iris, the colored part of your eye that controls the size of your pupil, and other places of the body too. Looking at functional properties of smooth muscle, again, it tends to be autorhythmic. 
largely works on its own where it's needed when it's needed, but of course endocrine and nervous system have control over it too, tend to contract in response to a sudden stretching. If you look at the walls of your blood vessels, that's exactly what they do. The pressure on the inside increases and starts to stretch that muscle. It tends to push back by contracting keeping those blood vessels a constant diameter, radius, however you want to look at it, but of course you can change that with the nervous system rapidly. They also exhibit a relative constant tension, what's called vasotone, when you look at the walls of the smooth, uh, the smooth muscle and the walls of the blood vessels. And the amplitude of the contraction remains constant, although the muscle length varies. So you see a little change in amplitude there too. Looking at regulating the smooth muscle, this is controlled by a division of the nervous system called the autonomic. When you hear autonomic, think automatic. The autonomic nervous system controls almost everything in your body because almost everything <clears throat> is controlled automatically by the nervous system. You don't have to think about it, and that's good. That frees up your mind to do many other things. When you look at the neurotransmitters, which work to regulate smooth muscle, there's acetylcholine and norepinephrine. There's some important hormones like epinephrine and oxytocin. Oxytocin is the chemical signal that opens up ligand-gated calcium channels on the smooth muscle of the uterus, causing labor contractions. Also works in a similar way to cause milk release. So you'll see lots of receptors on the cell membranes for many different chemicals. Neurotransmitters will be discussed later too. Let's look just a second at cardiac muscle. Remember this is only found in your heart. It's striated like the skeletal, but not nearly as well, where the smooth doesn't have the striations. These cells usually have one nucleus most of the time, and they have these ion channels connecting them called intercalated disc. That allows them to work together in a very coordinated fashion, and that cardiac muscle better do that, or you're not going to be moving blood the way you should. Action potentials take much longer to occur in cardiac muscle, a hundred times longer than what it does with skeletal. You need a very slow, very slow, very forceful contraction when it comes to cardiac. You want to move blood that's a thick, viscous material, you need slow, strong muscle. Where skeletal is the opposite, very rapid and fast. So we'll see a comparison of that in cardiac in a future chapter. And calcium is still very important when it comes to cardiac muscle working. So look at the effects of aging right here. Skeletal muscle mass is probably going to peak by the age of 25 for most all people. After that, it's probably not going to work as well. So it'll take a longer time for it to respond to stimulus, say from the nervous system. You're going to have less stamina, won't be able to do as much work as you did before. You're going to have an increased recovery time, probably lose some of the muscle cells for one reason or another. And with fewer capillaries, you'll get less exchange between the muscle cells and the blood. And with less nutrients coming in and waste going out, the muscle's not going to work as well as it did before.